Polo Audio is known for their R2R decks. The CM2 is targeted at those with a tighter budget but with Holo Audio desires. It uses the same conversion techniques as the higher priced versions. A clear difference with the more upmarket models is the absence of buttons, knobs and display. Input selection is done automatically and information about which input is active at which sampling rate is given by a row of LEDs. That saves the cost of buttons, switches, knobs, a display, display driver and more complex logics. But let's first see how the CN2 is to be used. The CM2 is a digital to analog converter, so it needs a digital source. In these modern times that will be a network bridge or network player connected to your router over either network cable or Wi-Fi and to the CN2 over either a HDMI 75 ohm RCA, 110 ohm XLR or optical toslink cable. A direct connection to the computer over USB is also possible. Having access to the internet you can play from streaming services and internet radio stations. And if you have music stored in your computer or NAS that can be played too. Usually the player is controlled using a smartphone or tablet. If you still use a CD player that can be connected to using a 75 ohm RCA or optical Toslink cable. RCA is the preferred choice here. Also the digital audio output of your TV can be connected. This normally is an optical Toslink cable. Since the CN2 has no input selector and chooses the input that sees a signal, it is important to switch off sources that are not used. To hear the analog outputs on the CN2, an amplifier is to be connected over either RCA or XLR cable, one per channel. And of course a set of loudspeakers has to be connected to the amp unless you listen to headphones over the amplifier. The CN2 does not have a headphones output. The design style of that cabinet is in line with other Holo Audio DACs. Black front, top and black with brass side panels. It's a very sturdy construction that measures 300 by 200 by 48 mm and weighs 3.5 kilos. On the front we see four rows of LEDs. From the left the first one indicates the power status and the active input. The second and third row show the sampling frequency where the second row indicates 44.1 kHz based sampling frequencies and the third row 48 based ones. As can be seen here sampling frequencies up to 1536 kHz are supported but only over the I2S and USB inputs. The fourth row shows the DSD sampling rates. And also there the maximum sampling rate can only be achieved using the I2S and USB inputs. SPDIF, Toslink and AES EBU are limited to 196 kHz PCM and DSD 64 over DOP by standards. On the right, looking from behind, we see the power switch with next to it the IC mains inlet. Then the digital inputs, AES EBU on XLR, USB audio class 2 on USB B, optical on Toslink, I2S on HDMI and SPDIF on RCA. When using SPDIF and AES EBU it's best to use audio grade cables for digital audio applications. And to be honest, using quality cables for USB and Toslink isn't a bad idea either. For I2S best use an HDMI cable suited for 4K video. And please do realize that although the HDMI sockets are used, you cannot connect video gear to this input. I2S is a totally different connection that misuses the HDMI cabling since it can transport bits at a very high speed. Time for the analog outputs that are available in both balanced on XLR and single ended on RCA. When opened up we see dense circuit boards and a large O-core transformer. 
Since it is a linear power supply, it can work on one voltage, so it has a voltage selector that is switchable between two voltages. The manufacturer specifies 110 to 150 volts or 220 to 230 volts. The voltage selector here indicates 220 volts. When we look at the transformer, we see it can deliver 50 VA and has primary windings rated at 2 times 115 volts. Let me explain. When these two primary windings are in series, they are set for 230 volts and when they are in parallel, they are set for 150 volts. The 220 volts indication on the switch thus is not completely correct, which of course isn't a problem by the way. So let's continue. Next to the transformer we find the power supply electronics that changes the low AC voltage from the secondary windings into a low voltage DC. Then we come to the digital inputs. The USB Audio Class 2 input is taken care of by the Altera Max 2 processor, allegedly running proprietary code. It accepts PCM up to 1536 kHz, DSD up to DSD 512 using DOP and up to DSD 1024 in native format. The signal passes through galvanic separators to the board below. There we find the I2S and AS3 inputs. The I2S signal passes a transformer for galvanic separation and then is sent to an ARM Cortex M microprocessor that functions as a receiver chip. I2S accepts PCM up to 1536 kHz and DSD up to DSD 1024 in DOP or native format. The AS3 inputs SPDIF, AES-EBU and TOSLINK are handled by the AKM AK4118AEQ receiver chip. Naltera Max 2 processor further takes care of the input signal and passes it through to the ladder converter board. The advantage of a ladder converter is that no upsampling is used. Upsampling can be done extremely well but then it's rather costly. Think of converters by Cord, Grim Audio, Mola Mola and PS Audio. Unfortunately, DAC chips with integrated upsampling have limited capabilities. The limitation of regular ladder converters is the limited linearity. I've told this all before. The limitation lies in that for every lower bit, half the voltage of the previous bit is needed. If a DAC has a maximum output signal of 2 volts, all bits active give 2 volts and one bit active will give 1 volt. When we come at bit 16, it's now down to 30 microvolts. It's rather difficult, if not impossible, to find resistors with sufficient precision that can achieve that. In the Cyan 2, an Altera Max 2 processor connects the resistor values by combining them with additional resistors and that works more precise down to a certain level. Measuring its linearity shows deviation starts below about minus 100 dBFS, which is better than simple ladder converters normally achieve, but it's clearly not as good as the best upsampling converter I have measured in this price class, as can be seen here. The deviation at minus 120 dBFS is still small. But to achieve this, there is a price to be paid in the time domain. This is the impulse response of that very linear oversampler. It has several filters, some of them have post echoes, this one has both pre and post echoes. Compare that to the impulse response of the Cyan 2. No pre echoes, no post echoes, perfectly clean in time. The question now is, what's of bigger impact to the sound? Superior linearity or super low time smearing? People that follow my channel know my answer. The latter, by far. This all goes for PCM signals. DSD signals only need one resistor since it's a one bit signal. Where PCM registers absolute voltage values, DSD only measures if the next value is higher or lower than the previous, but 64 times or more faster than PCM on a CD. Holo Audio has developed a way to convert DSD to analog without any processing. 
It's called a factor step resistance network. How that works is unclear to me, but it does work and the listening test will show how well it does. From the output of the converter circuit the signal goes to the outputs over balance circuits based on the Texas Instruments OPA 1612A op amps. In my video connecting your DAC number 2, how digital can go wrong, I explained how AES3 signals, SPDIF, TOSLINK and AES EBU have the clock signal integrated in the data and how that can go wrong. Nowadays DACs like the CN2 offer I2S inputs. This not only has separate lines for the clock signal, it has a data stream line and a word select line. The clock marks when a new bit is sent. The word select indicates whether the bit in that clock slot is for the left or the right channel and the serial data sends the bits. Because of the separation between the clock and the data, I2S is often seen as a better interface. I like to think differently, based on my experience. Both AES3 and I2S can perform near to perfect, it largely depends on how well engineers have designed the interfacing in both the sending and receiving device. Having said that, I think it's somewhat easier to design a good I2S interface than it is to design an AES3 interface. On the CN2, the I2S input is on an HDMI receptacle and uses the PS Audio de facto standard for the pinout. It therefore worked perfectly with my reference network player, the Magna Mano MK3 Farad streamer. Apart from the power switch on the rear, there are no controls. Input switching is done based on the input that receives data. As a consequence, all connected equipment should be powered off with the exception of the device playing. It really can't be simpler. The CN2 was listened to in my setup 2 first. It was connected to the Marantz PMKI Pearl Light over Siltec London RCA cable. The M drives the Acoustic Energy Radiance 1 loudspeakers connected over Kimber 4PR loudspeaker cable. They are supported by the RELT5 subwoofer that is connected to the loudspeaker terminals on the Marantz using the cable that came with the sub. The CN2 received the I2S signal from the Magna Mano MK3 Farad streamer over a short 4K HDMI cable. It runs Rupi XL. The network switch is the Optron Audio Ether region with Optron Audio Ultra Caps 1.2 power supply. The connection was made over a CAT6 patch cable. The equipment is housed in a target rack. Ok. This is a very convincing DAC. It sounds clean, well timed and almost free of sibilance problems. The stereo image is excellent, the lows go deep, the mids and highs sound open. I haven't heard a DAC sound better in this setup. So let's take it to my setup 1B. Here the CN2 was connected over Grim Audio SQM XLR cables to the Air Acoustics AX520 amplifier. It drives a PMC FAC12 signature loudspeakers on stack audio over 70 isolators and connected over AudioQuest Robinhood Zero loudspeaker cable. The digital source again was the Magna Mano MK3 Farad running the Rupi XL software. It was connected again over a short 4K HDMI cable. The network connection comes from the Zixel GS1900-10HP switch that is filtered by the Network Acoustics Eno system. The equipment was placed in a Creative Trend 3 rack. There was a lot more hidden in this gem that now comes out. The lows not only go deep, they also have a lot of texture. Midrange sounds very velvety, very natural clean natural voices and strings while brass sounded as brass should sound. Highs are very silky, 
triangle and glockenspiel sounds almost perfect. If the stereo image had been even better than clearly above average, I would have rated the Cyan 2 lower range set of 1A. Now it's top range set of 1B, the territory of clearly more expensive DACs. This is an extremely good sounding DAC for the money. Let me stress once more that using the right quality digital source can have significant influence on the sound quality of any DAC. I use the Magna for a reason since I bought it after having tested many streamers. Using the Rupi XL software let me use it with Rune, DNLA, Airplay, Spotify, HQ Player, Squeezebox and Plexamp, which is great for a reviewer. But the primary reason is the quality of the digital outputs in my case AES, EBU and I2S, for that can have large impact on the sound quality. I'll come back on this in the near future. The CN2 offers stunning sound quality given its price of just below 1400 euros including 21% VAT. Of course some corners had to be cut. No input selection, no volume control and no display. But hey, your amp has a volume control. The LEDs provide the same info and how difficult is it to switch off unused sources. And if you doubt, go and listen to this gem and then think again. It would be an easy decision, believe me. And on that bombshell we come to the end of this video. As usual there will be a new video next Friday at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to my channel or follow me on Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I am Hans Beekhuizen. Thank you for watching and see you next week. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.